well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Whenever you may be tuning in to the Growing Our Future podcast, we're just glad you're here. You know, we really enjoy putting this podcast together and, you know, bringing on subject matter experts, people that are that are so willing to share their time, their talents, their insights, their experience, their expertise. And, uh, you know, like we say, if you want to know what the future is, grow it. Well, the way you grow something is you got to plant the right seeds. And that's what this podcast is about. Listening to people's stories, their testimonies, and taking some of those seeds that made them great and putting them in place in our lives to make our futures brighter too. Today is no different. We have a very special guest today. I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this. Lada Garcia, Dr. Garcia, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the Growing Our Future podcast. Absolutely. I was excited when uh, you guys reached out and asked me to be a part of this. So I think I'm a bit more excited than you are. (laughs) I'm excited. And we will talk briefly, just so everybody knows, we will talk briefly on our associations. We each have very unique associations with The Ohio State University, and we'll talk about that. But Lada, just to get started, one of the things that I like to do on these podcasts, um, the very first question that I like to ask to start off every podcast is what are you grateful for today? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, first of all, I woke up this morning. You know, it's uh, it's no secret around here in the state of Ohio that I love my job. It's And it's not a job to me. Mm-hmm. And this morning, you know, when I was preparing for the day, because I have a full day today, um, I, just, I just gave my thanks for having... Uh, you know, the job that I have, it's fun. It's not, it, it doesn't feel like a job. So to keep it short, I'll just say uh, just where I am, you know, job wise, I get to hang out with you for a short while today and our, and our guests. Um, so, yeah. I agree with you, by the way, I love your smile. I love the way that you approach it because I'm the same way. You know, it doesn't take long if you just turn on the news or you scroll too much social media you're liable to find yourself getting a little negative. Absolutely. But if you'll just take a moment and look around at all the things that we have to be grateful for, it kind of provides some new energy, some some hope. And, uh, you know, folks like you who are passionate about your job, uh, that's contagious. Other people, <laughs> other people draw from that. And I think that's a good thing. And uh, I agree with you. I'm, I'm the same way, by the way. I love my job. I tell people, uh, you know, I love my family. I love my freedom. I love my liberty. There's there's so many things that I'm grateful for. Uh, not, not I'm not ignoring the problems of our world. I'm just saying I'm, there's a lot that I'm grateful for. And when you talked about your job, one of the things I tell people is if you'll manage it just right, at the end of every month, you might have just a little bit of money left over. <laughs> and And if you do, guess what? You might just be able to help somebody else. That's right. You might need a little bit of a hand up. So I think it's great that we reflect and say, hey, I'm grateful for my job. Absolutely. (laughs) And it sounds like you have fun doing your job. And I think that's a good thing, too. Well, I'll tell you, the students around here, you know, um, I'll tell you, I'm a big kid at heart. You know, when we're we're just uh, just blessed to be around the future, our future in of of agriculture, which is our students. But anyhow, I'll I'll go ahead and stop there. Oh no, you're doing good. You're doing good. Yeah, there's a Jimmy Buffett line that talks about growing up, and I'm kind of like, "Yep, that's me." So, kind of <laughs> refuse to grow up. You know, I want to, I want to stay young and at heart and energetic, and always looking and wondering and asking. And uh, I, I think that's a healthy place to be. So, oh, absolutely. You know, Aaron, I was, uh, you know, I, I teach quite a bit here, but. Uh, without getting too much into it, you know, our our students today just, um, you know, they struggle a little more, Um, you know, mental health is a real, is a real deal, is a real issue, it's a real thing, and uh, I do the best I can to let that inner child, inner kid come surface, uh, because I'm funny, I am funny, (laughs) and, uh, you know, anytime that I can put a smile on their faces um, makes it worth it, right, it makes the day a lot better, and to let them know it's all going to be okay. There you go. That That's what they need right there. That Just that simple baseline, that 
that little reset button, if you will, it kind of pulls the temperature down. It sometimes makes us reflect a little bit that maybe it's not as bad as we, as the news right. tell us it is. That's and, right. You know, uh, right. I don't know if y'all have these big super centers out there. We have them here, these things called Walmarts. There's a bunch of them around. <laughs> I always tell people, isn't it amazing that we can go through Walmart and Walmart's probably one of the few places where you've got every socioeconomic, uh, every demographic group, every religious group, every, you think about it. Walmart is the potpourri dish of anything you could think of. And isn't it, isn't it amazing that we can walk through Walmart and we can help people find stuff or make recommendation or answer questions and wave at people and there's no riots or protests or anything. I'm like, if, if everything we saw on the news was true, how come it's not always at Walmart? <laughs> That's valid. So it's that like, is valid. <laughs> to your point, let's look around and see what, what are the good things that we have and the people in our lives that can be those encouragers. And uh, I, I just know that the students, their value, that role that you're playing there. Thank you. So let's talk about this a little bit. Let's talk about I know that you did not just fall into that seat. I'm sure there is a pathway that you were on that led you to the job that you are in. So if you will, you are a Texas native. So I would love for you to reach back and take us along that journey that took Lada Garcia to the Ohio State University. Well, you're you're making me go back uh, a ways now, you know, having to retarden my memory bank but it does bring a smile to my face though when I when I do think about it um, I'm originally from South Texas um, a town called Hebronville it's in Jim Hogg County 40 miles east of the Texas Mexico border and about 80 miles um, west of Corpus Christi right by the Gulf Coast or um, the Gulf of Mexico and so you know South Texas is uh, predominantly Hispanic, at, at least more so when I was growing up in the early in the 80s. And, um, you know, that culture, you know, the culture is strong. The Hispanic culture, you know, it's, it's a blend of the, you know, strong Mexican traditions uh, with the American traditions, you know, blurred together to to uh, develop what I would consider the Hispanic culture. Right. And so um, mom and dad, you know, were big, big influencers in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. Dad had a third grade level education, but what I like to call also described him as um, with a PhD in life, if that if that makes any wow. sense. Um, my mother has a master's degree. You know, both of them grew up very poor, worked very hard. Um, you know, I'm sure and then he can relate to this as dad would wake up at four in the morning. He was a ranch foreman for one of our bigger ranches in Jim Hogg County. So he'd leave the house at about four thirty, five in the morning, come home about six, seven, right? Mom was a public school teacher, had a master's, as I mentioned, but then she also had two to three, two other jobs in addition to her public school teaching. So growing up, my sister and I, all we did was watch mom and dad work to death. They were what most would call workaholics, but it was primarily because they wanted to make sure that we had what we needed. And 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 let me make it clear, mom and dad didn't give us everything we wanted, right? It was all about needs and then saving money. You know, these were lessons that started very early in life. Mm -hmm. And so in our neck of the woods, brush country, as we as we often refer to it, you know, education is big. You know, I have to say that my school district was very good and very and very proactive in promoting higher education no matter what you know and and at the time you know uh texas a&m was big, big the university of texas was big we had texas a&m kingsville at the time it was texas a&i if you remember that, remember that. um you know and then uh, laredo um acquired texas a&m international so then as we were growing up all these universities started to have a presence in our schools so my sister, who were nine years apart, met my brother-in-law. Uh, his name is Stephen Young, who was a coach straight out of Texas Tech University. That's how Texas Tech started in my journey, right? Oh. Um, he began to talk to me about Texas Tech University. I hadn't heard of Texas Tech at that time. 
And so, you know, every time he would head back to New Mexico, he'd stop in Lubbock, he'd get me a shirt, he would uh, stop by the College of Ag, Kasner at, at the time, um, and, um, and would just slowly start planting seeds with me. Well, then by the time I knew it, you know, I was going through junior high, middle school, and high school, where I started to pay a little more attention to Texas Tech. And then I enrolled in my first ag class with Mr. Juan Flores, if you remember him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's retired now. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I started with land judging with him, um, you know, went through my first introduction to animal sciences, learned about breeding, marketing, you know, nutrition, you name it, management uh, practices, health all the way to my senior year where um, I think my favorite class was machine and shop, right? Welding was something I really loved. Um, but during this time, you know, with under the direction of Mr. Juan Flores and Mr. Humberto Garcia, mm -hmm. you know, they were tough and their expectations were high. So mm -hmm. not only did I have that with my own mother and father, I now I had that with our two ag teachers and um, they didn't settle for less. It was give it your all and that work ethic, right? Again, it started at home, but then it continued on now. And this was the beginning of what I was about to get into. And so um, I did land judging and livestock judging was were uh, um, officers, you know, throughout four years. And then lo and behold, I received a full ride scholarship to judge livestock at Clarendon College. Wow. Now, mind you, Aaron, I wasn't going to college, um, even though I had known about, you know, college at the time, I was perfectly fine going into the Air Force. Um, I, I tell my friends about this all the time and they laugh and say, oh, yeah, we could totally see you like a G.I. Jane, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I eventually chose uh, college. I, I decided to give it a chance. And let me tell you, I made 11 years of it. <laughs> so after Clarendon College, you know, I uh, went to Texas Tech University, where in 2002, I fulfilled my 12-year uh, goal eventually, because Texas Tech was still in the back of my mind. Mm. Um, and while at, you know, at uh, Clarendon College, um, I guess I'll backtrack just a little, even though I went on, on a full ride for livestock judging under Mr. Jerry Hawkins at the time, I uh, still adore that man, respect him so much. Um, I actually got a taste me, of meat me, judging. Me, me too, by the way. We we could have a Jerry Hawkins discussion, but keep going. <laughs> uh, I was introduced to meat judging because at the time at, at Clarendon College, we had to judge at least two extracurricular um, events. Mm -hmm. And that was between meat judging or equine, and I chose meat judging. And let me tell you, as soon as I stepped foot in my first packing plant, beef packing plant in Plainview, Texas, at the time it was an XL and then Cargill, right? Yep. Um, I knew I was done. And so I went to visit with Mr. Hawkins and I said, look, I don't, I'll finish. I'd like to finish the semester, but I'd like to use my scholarship for me judging. This is what I want to do. And of course, you know, he, he, uh, he agreed and I uh, was still my mentor, and then I rolled into Texas Tech University under Mark Miller and others, and was on that meat judging team with uh, Dr. Miller. Um, you know, and then I one day Dr. Miller came to me and said, "You know, hey," he said, "Garcia, West Texas A and M University is looking for someone to work on a master's under Dr. Ted Montgomery, and um, and also coach a meat judging team." They want to restart that program. And I thought of what's a meat science degree and what do we do? And I don't. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my sister and my mother, because at the time my sister was working on her master's as well. And then I I enrolled in uh, at West Texas A&M University in Canyon, Texas, and was un under the tutelage of uh, Dr. Ted Montgomery. And, you know, he also has the Beef Carcass Research Center where we traveled nationwide um, collecting beef carcass data, not just for research, but for FDA trials, you know, for, for ranchers, for um, beef producers, um, companies, you name it, for whoever needed carcass data, we were there to do it. And um, so I coached a, a meat judging team there, started it back, I think I did, I don't know, I think I did well, I don't know. Um, and then uh, David Griffin, Dr. David Griffin from Texas A&M, we were at Fort Worth um, at the South, at the, I'm sorry, at the 
at the eastern or the southeastern contest i'm kidding the southwestern Western, contest uh, yeah yeah um and pulled me aside and said hey have you thought about a phd and i said no sir he said why don't you come on down to a&m he said and just browse well, you know what? I've learned over the years that when people use those nice little words, there is more to it. So I went down there to browse and I met with Dr. Jeff Sable, Dr. Dan Hale, you know, all these rock stars. I didn't even, I didn't quite know at the time. So I went down to Texas A&M and I'll never forget Dr. Jeff Sable at the very end of, of our, of my, what I thought was a visit. It was an interview. I didn't know that. Um, he walked me to my vehicle out, out in front of Clayburg, um, and he said, this is going to be like a marriage situation. I need to hear an I do. <laughs> and I said, an I do for what? He said, I'm offering you a position here at Texas A&M University to work under me. Wow. And in that moment, my intuition, this little voice in my head said, you need to say yes. This is a chance of a lifetime. So in that moment, without even discussing it with anyone, I said yes. And that's how it happened and how I rolled into Texas A&M. And I was there for roughly four and a half years because I was also given the opportunity to coach and meet judging team. Um, and that was a 2007 team. I was very blessed to be just in that position as a, as a graduate student to coach Right. I mean, that just brings so much more to the table, but we'll, we can talk about that later. And then when I was done at Texas A&M, um, Dr. Mark Miller and Dr. Mindy Brashears and Dr. Kevin Pond at the time called me and said, hey, you know, we're, we are going down to Austin, Texas to give our testimonies uh, to the Texas um, Board of Education regarding, if you remember, Aaron, back then, that was when we were trying to get, was it the was it the two plus two where we were going to fight to get uh, the, uh, was it advanced animal sciences and some other courses approved for college credit regarding science and mathematics? Yeah, science and mathematics, yeah. It was, it was in 2009 when this happened and they invited me to go down with Gordon Davis and um, some others. And so I said, sure. So I drove down to Austin. I was with that Texas Tech group with those Red Raiders. We, you know, we talked about some things and my role was to talk about my journey and the importance of these courses and mm -hmm. where, you know, how I've benefited from them as being as a young female Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And it was there at that time that we were all having dinner and Dr. Kevin Pond and Dr. Mark Miller and Dr. Mindy Brashears, they had a plan here, Aaron, and I didn't know about it. They all asked me if I would consider coming back to Texas Tech to do a one-year postdoc. I said, wow. well, what does that entail? And so long story short, of course, I'm going to go back to my alma mater, right? That's where my heart is. I mean, to this day, I still bleed red and black. And so I went back for a year, um, which then evolved into a visiting assistant professor position. So at, with that, I, and um, I was I was able to teach an undergraduate meat science class for non-agricultural majors, which was very interesting. Travel with the uh, Benny Brashear's food safety team to Mexico and Central America and attempt to, to make their meat supply safer. But then I also was asked by the college to recruit and increase the Hispanic population for Kasner. So I had three roles. Mm. And um, mm. then by the time I knew it, uh, you know, it just it gets to a point where you're ready to spread your wings a little more. And, uh, you know, Texas Tech has has some really strong meat scientists. And that's, of course, that's what my my formal training is, is and is in meat science. And I just decided, to, well, I think it's going to be time for me to go. And at that moment, my good friend, Brad, Dr. Brad Kim, who's now at Purdue University, called and said, hey, there's a position up here that has your name on it. Um, it's teaching an extension and a little research in meat science. And it just so happened that Ohio State had the same position identical. So I applied to both and Ohio State moved faster. Of course, I'm a little impatient. That's part of that's part of what I got to work on in this lifetime is patience. And all within a month and a half, you know, I had someone, I had the department chair call me and I was still in Lubbock and said, positions yours if you want it. So I've been here since January of 2015. And uh, let me tell you, Ohio's been really good to me. They really have.
Okay, number one, I knew a little bit about your story, but I did not realize how many similar paths we have crossed. And really, oh, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So I want to come back to that. Let's talk about your role at Ohio State University. Tell us what that role entails as the associate professor of meat science and extension meat specialist. What kind of share with us what that looks like on a daily basis? So, you know, on a daily basis, so I oversee the undergraduate um, meat science um, courses for the most part. We offer roughly about um, seven meat science courses. I, I lead about, about three or four of them, uh, three to four depends on the year. Um, and so, and then I advise about 37 students, more or less. It, it, sometimes it, it varies, but right now I'm roughly at about 37. Um, and I also oversee the meat judging team. So I'm the coordinator of the meat judging team. Um, of course, that's, you know, that's another, another piece that I have to um, keep up with. But uh, I also do a lot of extension. I love extension. Extension to me goes back where I came from, right? And helping communities and, and so many. And so I currently have a 50% teaching appointment and a 50% extension appointment. Hmm. I do have graduate students. Actually, I, we just graduated my master's student who's now going to head off to the University of Nebraska Lincoln for a PhD. Um, so I do do research as well. A lot of the research that I do is more applied. This is where meat processors or producers come to me and say, I have this problem and it's a continuous problem. Can you help? And that's where I'm able to take that, that challenge and incorporate it into um, the research, right? And then bring in students so that it's a it's a win-win situation where the students can take the lecture material, but then apply it, you know, hands-on it to understand the problem solving um, process. So um, and I did, so then you did mention extension meat special. I am one of two extension meat specialists here in Ohio, which is rare. Usually there's one or there's none, right? It depended on the state. And so my job is to serve the needs of not just our producers, but our meat processors, our government agencies, our stakeholder commodity partners and, and what have you. You know, I do a lot of a lot of educational programs for our commodity partners for youth and adult learners. So um, you know, taking everything that we teach here and then adjusting it to fill the needs of whatever they are. And so um I do travel quite a bit um you know and in the summertime i also judge carcass shows for county fairs offering carcass shows as part of the county fair or part of the competition um you know that starts in J july 1st and ends october 1st and with what those two three months um i'll judge roughly about 30 of them there's 88 counties here in the state of ohio um, and that's not including the other ones that do occur that i can't make it or make or that I call colleagues who did go through our program to help mm -hmm. um, serve a need, right, for our youth. So it's it's said uh, it's um, there's constant motion on my end. <laughs> you know, I'm here like this morning. I I came in at about six a.m. to try to play catch up, um, and then to prepare, you know, for the day, um, and then I'll probably end up leaving around seven seven thirty. Um, and that's usually the time where I just say enough, you know, it's just going to have to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, it's fun, though. I mean, I, I don't really have much to complain about. I learn every day there's something new. Um, and I and because there's something new, that's what keeps it fun and stimulating. Right. And then, of course, you know, the students stop by and I help them when I can. And so, yeah, that's kind of a day, one day for me. <laughs> I love your story and I love the path that you've been on. I love the fact we are going to talk about some of these things, by the way. So one of the things about these podcasts that I like doing is I don't like to sit here and say, you know, uh, lot of give us this, 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 and this. Uh, what I like to hear is you just tell your story. And as you tell your story, if people are listening, they find all of these incredible nuggets of gold, all these incredible benchmarks of that was a seed of greatness. Listen to what she did. Listen to what she explored. Pay attention to the fact that she was willing to put herself out there, that she was willing to take a chance, that she had good mentors. I mean, there are so many things that you've shared that are just incredible to someone's professional development. 
So when you're telling your story, I'm sitting here smiling because I'm thinking, when I was a kid at Boys Ranch, Jerry Hawkins was always there to encourage me when I came to the campus at Clarington. When I went to Texas Tech University, uh, Gordon Davis was always there. You know, Dr. Davis, I worked for him when he started CEV Multimedia. Uh, to this day, my wife asked me, why didn't I stay with him? Because <laughs> of, of where that's ended up. But, um, you know, I think about that path there. Uh, Dr. Mindy Brashears has been on this podcast. And it, fascinating, fascinating to hear her story and the things that she's done in her career. Uh, Dr. Pond, Janice and Kevin Pond are very dear friends. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, there's another example. Mark Miller, you know, the Nick Saban, if you want to, <laughs> you know, of, of meets judging. Right. And, uh, you know, Dr. Miller, I think his um, nephew uh, was a guy, a friend of mine named Brad Powell that I graduated with at Boys Ranch. And Brad passed away. And Mark Miller brought some words during his funeral that were just some of the most touching words, which really showed me the character more of who he was. That's probably reflected in the way that he coaches and judges and, and empowers others that are in his care. And uh, so I was really taken by that. Speaking of uh, Mark Miller, I'll, I'll throw you another one, short, brief one. I'll never forget when I was a junior at Texas Tech, he, he just randomly, or what felt to me, randomly came up to me and said, Garcia, what are you going to do this summer? And I, I kind of had to gather my thoughts. And I said, I, I don't know. He said, and, and I quote, he said, you're going to go to Friona and you're going to do an internship at Cargill. I said, I am. He said, yep. He said, I already got you lined up with Brad Churchill. You have to call him on this day at this time. He said, be sure to call him. And of course, you know, you do as you're told. I mean, that's the way it was in my household and don't question. And, you know, and, and of course I trusted him, no doubt. And so I called Mr. Churchill and we spoke and all within four minutes, he said, the job's yours if you want it, kiddo. He said, you can start on this day. And so let me tell you, Part of my formal training, what I didn't mention was that I did an internship with Cargill um, in Friona, and then that then led to another internship in Milan, Missouri. Mind you, I come from a populated town of 5,000, and now South Texas, and now I'm going to leave the state on my own to do a three-month internship. At the time, it was premium standard farms. That's now um, farmland. Oh, yeah. And uh, we were 25 university undergraduates all under one roof, three story house. I won't, I won't share any stories here on this podcast, but let me tell you, he, he was the one that just said, you're going to do it. And that was also a part of my journey that gave me that, that courage to try things, to stick my neck out. And if it works out great, if it doesn't, that's okay too. Right. And so, um, I've been very blessed, Darian, to have so many strong, genuine, good-hearted mentors in my life. Now, it wasn't always easy. Don't let me fool anyone. Sure. But the greater good was always at the forefront. You know, another one that you mentioned, uh, very, very, another friend of mine is uh, China Montgomery, and her dad was Ted Montgomery. And here's a story for you. When I was a senior at Boys Ranch, I was on the meets team. And Carrie Fortune was our meets teacher. And Carrie was a great meets coach, by the way. And Carrie, uh, he, he took teams to state all four years he was at Boys Ranch, all four different teams. I mean, he was a great meets coach. And we got to WT, and we could not understand why they were taking so long to give the judging results. I mean, they'd already announced livestock and dairy and horse. They'd have done everything, and they were waiting – Finally, they come in, they say, this has never happened before. <laughs> the top four individuals of the meets contest were all the boys, the four boys ranch meets team. Oh, wow. So we all, not only did we win, obviously, but we took all four top high individuals. <laughs> now, here's where the story gets funny. So that qualifies us to area at Texas Tech. So I go down to Texas Tech and, you know, I'm a pretty salty meets judger and I mismarked my car. So my card got thrown out. Now, thank goodness we still made it to state. 
But when I went to Texas Tech, I remember going by to visit Dr. Davis. And on his bulletin board behind his desk was my card, Miss Mark card with the word dunce written on it. Dunce. Dunce. <laughs> and as soon as I walked in, he said, Alejandro, look, you're right here. He said, this is what happens when you're not paying attention. Because you know what we call that? We call you a dunce. But that was Gordon Davis. That was his way of coaching and mentoring and saying, always pay attention. Little things can Correct. make a big difference. I cut meat and worked in the meat shop when I started at Texas Tech University. That was my first job. And uh, I'll never forget it. I had uh, had this ambition to run for state FFA president. Well, to do that, I had to go to the area competition. And so I asked, I'm not going to give you the name of the meat, the head of the meats department there at the time, the, the guy that was over the meats lab, because I don't want to incriminate him. But he told me if I went to that, that I was fired. He goes, don't come back to work. I said, you don't understand. If I'm going to run for area, it's a state office. I've got to go to the area contest. So I go to the area contest. I get the nomination. I come back. And he said, I told you, don't come back. So I got fired from my job. Only job I think I've ever been fired from. Matter of fact, I know it's the only job I've ever been fired from, but he fired me. But don't ever think that God doesn't have a plan because the right. day that he fired me, I got hired by First Supermarket, cutting meat at First Supermarket, making triple what I was making at Texas Tech University. There and you go. So I went on to, to cut meat until my, my career took a different path. But um, I love <laughs> I love all the names that you mentioned. That's why I'm saying it's amazing. All the way down to the Grandissimo Valle. I love the Valley. I love the Valley. We take teachers uh, every summer. We take teachers on a, a week-long leadership experience. And we'll do two years through South Texas, two years through, two years through Northeast Texas, then two years through West Texas. It never fails. When we go down to the Valley, the teachers always say, Aaron, this is the most incredible place we've ever been. The culture, the La Familia, yeah. the, the genuineness, uh, the agriculture. It's amazing to watch those teachers assimilate that South Texas culture. And for those people that are listening, sometimes people think San Antonio is South Texas. No, <laughs> no, you, you've got to keep going about four or five hours south and uh, you, you'll get down into the valley. And uh, but it is a special place. And so when you start referencing Mr. Flores and your ag teachers, I'm sitting here and I, again, another special place in my heart, because when I was state FFA president in 1985-86 and I traveled through the valley, uh, those are the very men that that encouraged me and made me feel confident in what I was this responsibility that I was carrying. So, again, when I look at your career path, Lada, and I think about where I've been we didn't know that we had so many commonalities. Correct. We, we did, Latinos in Agriculture Leadership Conference. I think that's where we first met for the first time. That's true. That's true. And Dr. Dr. Romero and his group, the, and then Dr. Romero's back at A&M, by the way. But anyway, it, it's interesting how you and I never knew that we had all of these commonalities, all tied to agriculture, all tied to FFA, tied to meat science. And, Texas uh, Tech, right? Texas Tech. And then we even have an Ohio State connection. So <laughs> for those people, I think a lot of people know that my next door neighbor, our kids all grew up together. My next door neighbor had kids the same age as mine. But my oldest son and their son um, went on to play football at Ohio State University, broke almost every Big Ten record, but the quarterback, J.T. Barrett. And oh, J.T. Barrett. Lotta, you're going to get a kick out of this. I've got a photo, and I'll have to send it to you. I've got a photo where I took JT to his very first D1 football game. <laughs> and I took uh, JT and my son Chandler to a Texas Tech game. That was their first D1 game. <laughs> now, I fast forward to tell you this. JT was on me and on me about coming to the shoe to yep. watch a game at the shoe. And so I told him I'll make it happen. So I brought my youngest son, William, and my daughter, Abigail, and we came out to the shoe to watch Ohio State and Michigan State game. And oh, goodness. That's a big one. It was a great game, but it was very awe-inspiring to have been to Red Raider Jones Stadium 
and then we go to the shoe, and there were more people in the shoe than in my town of Wichita Falls, Texas. <laughs> and uh, but I understood then why JT was so adamant that I needed to come experience a football game. Uh, in the shoe. Uh, additionally, one of our board members, one of my board members for the Texas FFA Foundation, Keith Klein, is a is an Ohio State season ticket holder and does a lot of work there with Ohio State with the captains and leadership development. And so, um, obviously, I've enjoyed watching your career. And uh, when you went to Ohio State, I just smiled because of all of these little common connections. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. I thought, no, no. Uh, yeah. Aaron, you mentioned something a little uh, a little while ago that I, I'd like to touch on. Um, the one thing I didn't mention growing up was, you know, in addition to to having such strong parents, and you know, we grew up Catholic, strong Catholics, mm -hmm. and um, and education was important, but with limitations. Okay, mm -hmm. I grew up with older parents, and, and so who grew up in a world where um, women didn't do the men jobs, right? And so when mom found out that I wanted to go into agriculture and I'd received a livestock scholarship, she wouldn't have it. She said, no woman belongs, and I quote, belongs in a man's world, which in this case meant agriculture. And I, I remember I was very upset. I didn't say anything because I had to gather my thoughts. I remember this. And I spoke to Juan Flores because I was traveling with him judging livestock. I think we were preparing to go to state, which is at Tarleton State University in Stephenville. And I said, sir, I said, you know, uh, this has happened and um, I'm not sure how to respond. I said, but, but yet she forbids me to go into the Air Force as well. <laughs> We're kind of closing doors on me here and so uh, Mr. Flores thought about it and he said you know well, since your mom is a school employee a district employee right with the school since she was a kindergarten teacher he said I'm going to invite her to be a female chaperone so we were four on the team two girls and two two guys and so she accompanied us and we stopped in San Antonio we stopped at, um, I think we went all the way up to Angelo State to practice. Mm -hmm. And then we may have gone to Texas Tech to do what we call the Texas run. Mm -hmm. And then so eventually we ended up in Stephenville. And the take home point to this is that when my mother was sitting in the stands watching us from afar, you know, all the all the classes set up, she on her own recognized that there were more females than males and this was back in 19 goodness uh 90 maybe 97 98 around there mm -hmm. and she was just taken back and and i and in the van she mentioned it to mr flores with all of us there and said i don't understand when did it change and mr flores said what you don't realize is that your daughter can be a part of this changing world to start, you know, recruiting future leaders. And, and I remember listening to this and understanding part of it, right? I understand so much more now, but it took that to convince her to let me go, not just to college, but to study a, a, a field that was predominantly of males. And then let's not forget that I'm a Hispanic. And now I'm leaving South Texas where I was the majority and now become the minority, right? So just with just, I mean, and I know we have so much more to talk about, but just what I've explained from start to now, let me tell you, my journey has been full of lessons, uh, experiences that have come with this to teach me so much that has shaped me. But it's part of it is because I've taken risks. I've, I've just decided we're going to give it a shot. And if it works, great. If not, I'll find something else. I just want you to know how thankful I am that you just shared that story. Okay. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. We live in a world today where we're checking a lot of boxes. And we like to talk about topics like diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those discussions are important. 
but you've got to drill down a little bit deeper to really understand what drives a lot of that. And um, I'm going to give you an example. And you're going to love this because it parallels exactly with what you just said. We have a lady that's on our foundation board of directors who you probably know. Her name is Della Sarna. And Della is from the Rio Grande Valley. She's at uh, La Paloma, El Coyote. Mm -hmm. And Della had a very successful ag science career. She went to A&M and got her undergrad. She went to Purdue and got her master's. And now she's back working on this ranch down in this incredible ranch down in South Texas. Well, I was talking to some of my colleagues and we were talking about board composition and who do you get to be on your boards and why? And I asked somebody, I said, well, why do you think Della Serna is on the foundation board? Well, they went to the immediate default position. Well, she's a Hispanic female. That's the reason she's on your board. Right. And as soon as they said that, I said, you are wrong. I said, <laughs> you're wrong. And I said, here's the reason why Della's on our board. And this is the reason why what Lada just shared is so important is because when you understand the culture that we're dealing, which is a beautiful culture, by the way, beautiful culture. But when you understand that culture, you understand there's a trust that has to be earned there. And that young Hispanic females are not supposed to go out overnight. You're not supposed to leave on trips. You're not supposed to go away from La Familia. You're supposed to stay close at home. You got to be careful about what job that is, what you're engaging in, because that's the culture a lot of times that a lot of these adults who are parents grew up in, and they kind of want that same thing for their kids. And if we don't understand that culture, then we can't build the trust to say, we're going to take care of your daughter. We're going to give them an opportunity. We're not going to throw them into an environment that they're going to be mistreated or abused. We're going to try to put them in an environment full of opportunity to improve. But if people don't understand that one little, we had two young ladies from East Texas, uh, uh, Brianna and Bailey Chavez. And I wanted them to come to Wichita Falls and film a little project for me. And I'll never forget it. The ag teacher said, well, we'll have to check with their family. I knew what that meant, by the way. As soon as they said that, I knew what that meant. They come to Wichita Falls. We're sitting there eating lunch. And I'll never forget it. I looked at them and I said, oh, so you had to get your daddy to say, okay. <laughs> and they looked at me and their eyes got real big and they go, how did you know? And I said, well, it's not that I want to know. It's that I understand. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you coming because Brianna and Bailey's example, a lot of your example, Della Serna's example, I believe those are the examples that we can use to open up minds, to build trust, and let us show culture that we're going to do everything that we can to encourage, empower, and inspire your children. We, we don't want to damage them, and we don't want to take them away from your family. We, we want to build their family. We want to make their family bigger by having a professional network that's bigger and, and a world of opportunity that's bigger. And so I just cannot, the, the whole interview, I wanted to hear your testimony, but I'm going to tell you, your willingness to share that cultural shift is huge when, when I think of the demographics of the FFA, of ag science education, uh, right here in the state of Texas, and I know it's growing nationally. So I'm going to make sure that National FFA gets a copy of this and they see this because this is the kind of dialogues that we need to be having. And we need ag teachers and extension agents to go out and do exactly what yours did and find innovative ways to bring those parents alongside of what the kids are doing. Uh, do you know Archimedes Reyes? Have your, has your path crossed with Archimedes? I don't think so. It's, it doesn't he, sound familiar. Archimedes was the meets coach down at, at uh, uh, San Angelo. Archimedes. Okay. Archimedes' dad whooped him pretty hard when he brought home his first ag jacket because he thought he stole it. And when he got his mom and dad to come to the FFA meeting and see what it was about and know that he earned that jacket, 
they never missed another FFA meeting the rest of his career. <laughs> it's cold. That was the beginning of a cultural change. Yep. It, that's, that's why I said I did not intend for you to go there on this podcast, but I've got to say, Lada, I appreciate you sharing that because that is a door opener for somebody else right there. Well, and, and I'll share, Aaron, that during my time at Texas Tech, at, you know, my last, uh, you know, prior to coming to Ohio State, I mentioned that I was recruiting for uh, Kasner. And, you know, at the time, there were only 8% Hispanic at the time. Mm. And so long story short, I went where I went to the places I knew, which was home, South Texas. And all my friends that I used to barrel race with or play around with team roping or just roping calves or whatever it was. They were now the agri science teachers. They were now the counselors. They were now, you know, in these in these roles. And so, um, part of my job was to not just visit with the students, but I knew I had to go the extra mile and visit with the parents. And let me tell you, I brought my mother along when I was in South Texas, and she was she was my secret weapon. She That's was, good. which good. in my mind, she redeemed herself from all the hard times she gave my sister and me. But I'll never forget. Uh, but anyway, so but because of that, remember at the beginning, I mentioned that growing up, we only heard of the University of Texas and Texas a and I'm happy to say that now Texas Tech is included now with these with these schools as another option mm -hmm. for our students in Hebronville, uh, Texas to attend. And let me tell you, there are more Red Raiders than I could have ever recruited back in the day now. But so many more of them are going off to college, too. So it's a win-win situation is how I see it. So just keep evolving. That's all we need to do to, to assure security for, for our future. And it's not just for ag, right? It's for just everything. But we've got, as you said, to be innovative. And we have to change with times. We can't just stick to the single song and dance because eventually it's going to become outdated. Well, I hope that one of the things that we've done today, by the way, is I hope that we get beyond an acronyms. We get beyond just saying we're checking boxes, that it is important to listen to the heart of what Lida just shared. Listen to the heart of her mom, the heart of her dad, the heart of her ag teacher, because it was all of those things that had to come into alignment for the dominoes to tumble and the right. doors of opportunity to start opening. Absolutely. And, uh, I think this dialogue is very healthy in creating, hopefully, bigger doors, by the way. Oh, Lida, we could just keep talking and talking and talking, but we, we got to wrap up. Uh, anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Sometimes when I when I think of my of me back then, you know, I, I with these students, you know, age ranging from what, 18 to 22, roughly, right? Each year I learned something new about our students and how, you know, their needs matter. That uh, the trust factor is key in my world. Mm -hmm. um, I often tell my students in my classes, we're a family until this semester ends. This is a safe space. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to share your thoughts. To, I definitely ask questions because otherwise I may not be fulfilling my job, what I aim for, in not just teaching you the material, but the lessons that come with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and when I do get to know some of our students who are either on the meat judging team or work in our meat laboratory, you know, um, you, it's, it's very rewarding to hear their stories. And it's our job to fine tune their skill set and strengthen them to be employable, mm -hmm. you know, um, I just said out loud to a group of people the other day that, um, you know, when it comes to the meat judging team, I'm not in it to win it. I'm in it to assure that our students have a place mm. to go for job placement. Mm. Right? A lot of our, our programs, ex extracurricular programs such as judging, I mean, and, and, and where it starts with FFA, right? You guys are doing a tremendous job preparing our students in that competitive in that competitive world that it's okay not to win if anything it makes us stronger but understand the why behind it to me these programs are stepping stones 
to, to what's coming their way. You guys prepare them for us. And all we do is take it a step further because that's the progressive system that's been at play since day one. So my hard hat goes off to you guys, Erin, and the FFA organization, because I get excited when I hear our students come from that, came from that program. And um, it, I don't know, it, it's exciting. Um, I believe in our future. We just can't let up. We can't assume. Okay. We just got to keep working. And as you know, FFA, ag, the educators, we've got a great team out there. And, and the fact that the majority of us and the vast majority of us are all aiming and for the greater good. That's beauty right there. Selfishness, it's there, but it's rare, right? It's all about the students. And that's what's going to keep our ag industry safe. Just we just got to keep evolving. And of course, you know, if there's ever if there is anyone out there who has questions, just wants to visit, especially parents, especially parents who have questions, because like my mother was clueless. Mind you, she had a master's sure. and in her mind, she she knew it. Mm -hmm. But especially when it's out of our realm of expertise or or um, comfort zone. Um, you know, the one thing I've learned about meat science, which applies to agriculture in a general aspect, is that meat science is a niche. Not everybody understands meat science, and that's okay. Sure. There are going to be people who don't care to learn about meat sure. science. That's right. It's the same thing with agriculture, right? But yet there's so much out there, so much STEM, so much science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that I don't know what more you could ask for. So I, I encourage and, and I welcome anyone who wants to visit or has questions or career paths. You know, this is what we're here for, because it's not really about us. At least it shouldn't be. It's about them. So I appreciate your time, Aaron, wow. and this opportunity. That's great, by the way. <laughs> Everything Lada said, ditto, 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 ditto. Um, Lada, we're, um, it's amazing. You and I are both out. I was in ag science back in the 80s. It was BOAG 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right. And then it changed to semester classes. And I learned just yesterday, our enrollment is uh, over 230,000. Our membership is going to be, when we give our next report to national, I think they said it's going to be in excess of 167,000 members. Outstanding. So, and that's in the urban, rural, suburban. I mean, it's it's all overgrowth. And uh, I think it's always good when we can connect kids to where food comes from and to understand all of those processes, the marketing, the engineering, the drones, the, the animal protein side, the, 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 the fiber side. I mean, all of it, uh, it's just chocked full of opportunities. And uh, I appreciate you noting that because um, it is. All right. Well, we got to wrap up. I don't want to. I want to just keep talking, but we got to wrap up. Um <laughs> everybody gets one last fun question. And so the last fun question for you is what is the best concert you've ever been to? Concert without a doubt, Def Leppard. Def Leppard. Def Def Leppard. I'm, I'm a big eighties rock fan, big eighties. And I actually saw Def Leppard. Was it three years ago, four years ago here at our, at our basketball arena. And even at their age, let me tell you, they rocked it. Oh my goodness, my sister, I, mean, I was telling my sister, because she's nine years older than I am, she's the one who contaminated my mind with 80s music, right? As my mother would say, uh, I kept telling her, I said, we've got to go, because I went with friends here, and that's been the best one ever. All right, so whenever you do meet Keith Klein down the road, remember I told you about Keith. Whenever, that's right. Whenever you meet Keith, remember this conversation, because I asked him, and his was a rock concert as well. So this is <laughs> great. Good. This is great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, for folks for tuning in. Uh, this was a very special Growing Our Future podcast on, on so many levels. Um, number one, personally, it's always great to reconnect with Lada. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for what she's accomplished in her career. Her willingness to open up and share those things that were those stones that she had to put in that creek so somebody else could step on those to get across to that other side, I think is beautiful. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln said that 
the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. So if we want to know what the future looks like, we got to grow it. And that's what Growing Our Future podcast is all about. It's about planting seeds of greatness that we can put in place in our lives, that we can share with others, so that we just make this world a little bit better place to live, work, and raise our children. Thank you for joining in. And until we catch you in the next episode, everybody be safe. Uh, Go out and do something extraordinary. Make a difference in somebody's life. And thank you for helping us grow a better future. Lada, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.